Dam, Chair of the Faculty Council, the university-wide governing body of faculty. Please join me in welcoming our Chancellor, J. Keith Motley, who will be opening the ceremony. Chancellor Motley. Good morning. Isn't it a wonderful morning out here? Oh my goodness. Class of 2012. Well, greetings everybody. I offer my welcome and I also declare that the 44th commencement exercises of the University of Massachusetts Boston are officially open. This I'm going to ask you all to rise because you're in for a treat. As graduating senior, Maya Pardo sings our national anthem for us. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming who's brought stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our continue to stand after something as fascinating as that as well. Maya, thank you so much. Are you ready? Well then, congratulations, University of Massachusetts, Boston, class of 2012. Now, before we begin, I'm going to ask you to remember your classmates who cannot be with us today because they're called to active duty and they're members of the United States Armed Forces, particularly those serving in Afghanistan. And so our thoughts and our prayers are with them and their families. Now, many graduates among us today have served our country. Those of you who are veterans, please rise and be recognized. We want to thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your university, the University of Massachusetts Boston, was founded to provide access to academic excellence. Members of the class of 2012, you are living proof that we here at the University of Massachusetts Boston are fulfilling our mission. 57% of the University of Massachusetts Boston undergraduates are first generation college students. I ask you now that if you're the first person in your family, as I am, to earn a college degree, please rise so we can recognize you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. 
I know you want to stand all day, but you can be seated. <laughs> yeah, you can sit down now. <laughs> Listen, class of 2012, I am so pleased and proud, first of all, to be your chancellor, but to help to usher in the next phase of your lives today to witness the bold steps that you are taking into the world. Truly, it has been a season of bold steps. Steps towards revitalization, steps toward growth, steps toward renewal. And while they certainly are not the end of the line, they are the steps that can be built upon to realize a new vision. To this end, We've moved from planning and talking about things to doing those things. We're constructing things all around you. The first new academic building since 1974, the Integrated Sciences Complex, is going up as we speak. This building does not represent, however, the peak of what we're going to be doing. It's a step that we'll just build on as we continue to grow as a university. Class of 2012, should you ever doubt your ability, which I hope you never do, to take bold steps, I urge you to turn to one of your classmates and draw inspiration and courage from one of them. They're right there next to you, people going on to change the world. So. If you're out there, turn to Benison, Pina, who joined this university community when he was only 15 years old through our Urban Scholars Program for middle and high school students. Ben boldly stepped out of his academic comfort zone to conduct research for our partnership with Dana Farber Harvard Cancer Center, one of the most renowned cancer centers in the world working with the Gaston Institute for the Latino Community Development and Public Policy, he created and tested ways to provide information on life-saving cancer screenings for the Catholic Latino community. After today, Ben wants to study how economics affects health care. And so we're still proud of Ben. Turn to Taylor Gagnon from whom Governor Deval Patrick honored last month as one of the 29 state college and university graduates who shine. She is taking a bold stance against childhood obesity, combining her background in exercise and health sciences with public policy to keep young children healthy. There's nothing more noble than keeping our children healthy. Inspired by her younger siblings, Taylor has started her own traveling yoga studio for kids. She has organized public health initiatives, like advocating for a bike path from Fall River to Bourne. Taylor will attend Drexel University in Philadelphia next year for a master's in public health and then return to this great commonwealth to begin a career in health education. Taylor, so proud, so proud, so proud. <laughs> Turn to do our time. Dora made a significant contribution to medical research while participating in a joint project with Children's Hospital Boston. Working with his advisor, Linda Hung, and a doctor at Childers, Children's, Dora found a compound that seemed to be a carcinogenic. He, his advisors asked him to study this compound further to learn its effects and its functions. Doctors and researchers have found that Dewar's compound helps protect brain cells. You know how important those brain cells are, don't you? You had to use them to get to this point. He helps them and keeps them from dying during strokes. Unbelievable, a double economics and biology major. Dewar is hoping to go into clinical research in order to make important discoveries in the changes world, just like every single one of you. 
or you can turn to Nicole Matthews. Nicole took the bold step of returning to school after earning an associate's degree with a husband, and a family, and a job, and she also had a two-hour commute. Sounds familiar. Nicole drove to campus from the South Shore every day, worked 50 hours each week at the Horizons for Homeless Children, and took a near full course load all while raising six children. Yeah, whoa. And you crying to me. I'm walking down the hallway and you crying. Chancellor, Chancellor, you know it's hard for me. Listen to that. She did it all to fulfill her childhood dream of becoming a teacher. Never gave up on becoming a teacher. And she will this fall be a teacher. And she's going to go out and change the world. She begins her new job at Seacomp Children's Workshop. So to Nicole's husband and her children that are out here, remember this day, your Nicole is an extraordinary University of Massachusetts, Boston prepared woman. Where y'all at? Stand up so I can see you. Yeah. Yeah, you thought you were hiding from me back there, Nicole. I know. Powerful story. <laughs> Those are just a few stories, but I got one more. Cammy, where are you at? Let me tell you, this young lady drives me crazy. We call her the Chancellor, because she works in my office and she's bossed me around for the last few years. That girl is from Brockton, Mass, and I'm so glad her dad and her mom and everybody else is getting ready to take her home. <laughs> you are not the chancellor. <laughs> I'm taking my title back, but I'm so grateful for your love and support over the year. I'm so proud you're graduating. I'm so proud of every single one of you because I could have told your story and we could have got the same reactions. So thank you, thank you, thank you. In case you haven't noticed, there are 3,810 folk graduating today. This class, if you can't take bold steps, there's something wrong. <laughs> you need to build on all that you learned and make some progress towards your bright futures because they're right out in front of you. Graduates, now you know that I know that you think you know that you did it all by yourself. I see you sometimes walking around pontificating and all that stuff, sitting around in the campus center meeting about your work. Well, your family and your friends had a lot to do with what you're doing today. They gave you a tremendous amount of support. Today's celebration is for them as well. Even though you got them sitting way back there somewhere, I ask you to rise up, class, and join me in thanking your loved ones with a resounding round of applause. Let them hear you over in Quincy. Okay, have a seat. I, you all love to stand up and hang out for a while, don't you? I like that. Hey, listen, let me tell you a secret. Continue, even with all these things you're accomplishing in your life, to keep caring family and friends around you during good times like this celebratory time and other times. They've made so many sacrifices for you and they've helped you to get where you are. I have an example of that here with me today, my beautiful wife sitting down here in the front. If I'm a little distracted as I go through this program, you know if I look down this way, understand it please. Angela Motley, thank you for being here today. Hey, listen. 
listen, when I come up on this stage, the greatest sight to see is the wonderful University of Massachusetts Boston faculty. So many of them are seated up here on this stage and others are out working. They include those who are current faculty, retired faculty. Some are sitting out in the audience. Some are working out there. They've assisted during this ceremony and they are also proud of you. Let's give them a round of applause. Behind me on the stage, also, Massachusetts Board of Higher Education Chair Charles Desmond, one of the University of Massachusetts Boston's sons who now leads this commonwealth and so shows his support for public higher education and for you also, it's inspiring products. Charlie's here with us today. Thank you. So, you're about to join class of 2012, 90,000 alumni, including members of the 50th and 40th anniversary classes that are present with us today, representing. And you're going to laugh today because you think you're in 2012 and all this other stuff sounds so long ago. It happens quick. I used to be you. I used to be you. I was saying the same thing. So the class of 1962, graduating class of Boston State College, we welcome class president James J. Cody. Where's James at? We also welcome Kenneth J. Feinberg, representing the class of 1972. And we also welcome to the University of Massachusetts, Boston, former university, former university um, trustee, and someone who's made a tremendous difference in this university over the years, trustee Dennis Austin. Now I pause because Dennis was on our board and he represented this university well. And he's a member of the class of 1972 and someone who made a tremendous difference. So I just wanted to say hello to him and let you know how important it is once you leave here to continue to work with this university to give something back. Dennis. We also recognize the president of the University of Massachusetts Boston Alumni Association, Adrian K. Hagerbrook. Adrian is from the class of 2002. We're getting closer to you guys now. And I'd also like to introduce members of the University of Massachusetts Board of Trustees. Student trustee Bianca Belazar of Boston. Where's she at? Student trustee Bianca Belazar, stand up. Trustee Richard Campbell, Trustee Jeff Mullen, Trustee Margaret or Marty Exafaris, Arthur Mabbitt, Chair of the Board of Visitors, and Selma Sachs, Vice Chair, have joined us today. Thank you for recognizing our dedicated trustees and our Board of Visitor members. They work hard for us, they're unpaid, they volunteer, they make a difference. They work for this entire university community and our campus. And so, it is now my privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce Trustee Jeff Mullen, who brings greetings on behalf of the University of Massachusetts Board of Trustees. Thank you, Chancellor Motley. Distinguished guests, faculty, fellow trustees, families, friends, and graduates. It's an honor to participate in UMass Boston's 44th commencement. I thank President Corrett and Chancellor Motley for your leadership in moving UMass Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts forward. 
On behalf of Chairman Jim Karam and the University of Massachusetts Board of Trustees and University of President Bob Perrette, let me first congratulate the graduates. Let me secondly congratulate all of your families who no doubt played no small role in helping to make you graduates. It is, by any measure, a significant accomplishment worthy of a ceremony such as this and an important day in all of your lives. As graduates, today you confirm your place as part of the university family for the rest of your lives. Know that as you go out and do the great things that we know that all of you will do, UMass will need you. Indeed, the Commonwealth will need you. Pledge to yourselves today to get engaged and stay engaged. I assure you that you will not regret making and keeping that commitment. Let me acknowledge the Distinguished Chancellor's Medal recipient and commencement speaker, Ambassador Anwar Ol Karim Chowdhury, the leading UN Culture of Peace emissary. Congratulations, Ambassador. And let me also acknowledge and congratulate our distinguished honorary degree recipients, the late Ernest A. Linton, the great philanthropist Carla Linton, Jackie Jenkins Scott, the president of Wheelock College, and Pastor James Wuye and Iman Muhammad Ash Ashafa of the Interfaith Meditation C Center. Congratulations to you all. I will close my remarks by urging all of you to relish this day and to remember what made it possible and what makes it special. There is much to celebrate. Years of hard work led to this moment of commencement, a day when you start the rest of your lives. You sacrificed and your family has sacrificed for you. Be sure to thank them and to thank all of those who helped you achieve this dream. And as you commence your march toward your other dreams, remember that as a member of our family, if you ever need us, the university will always be right here for you. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you so much. Now we confer awards on four exemplary faculty members. We begin with the award for distinguished teaching. Chancellor Motley, I have the privilege to introduce from the Department of Sociology in the College of Liberal Arts, the recipient of the 2012 Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching Sociology Graduate Program Director and Professor Stephen Lee Hartwell. You can see it's already turned into a love fest. Professor Hartwell. Your passion for your field is so contagious that your students can't help but mirror it. Sixteen of them wrote in to support you for this award. One says you taught her how to be a successful graduate student. Another says that because you demand so much of yourself, you expect your students to not only match, but exceed your level of preparedness and intensity. You offer students hand-on learning opportunities that draw on in class sessions and help them find meaningful work after graduation. You inspire them to serve others. In recognition of your abilities and accomplishments, I am pleased to present you with the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching.
Just Chan one example. Tell you. Chancellor Motley, I have the privilege to introduce from the Department of American Studies in the College of Liberal Arts, co-recipient of the 2012 Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship, Department Chair and Professor Rachel Rubin. Now, um, Professor Rubin, in your relatively short academic career, you've already written, edited, or co-edited seven volumes, published dozens of articles in journals, and edited an acclaimed series on popular music. You are a natural seeker of knowledge with a range of interests from Jewish mobsters to Renaissance fairs. The common denominator in your research is your ability to place your findings within complex historical frameworks, deepening their weight and their implications. You pay attention to racial, gender, and socioeconomic constructs and contexts, treating your subjects with empathy and recognition of your research and expertise, I am pleased to present you with the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship. Chancellor Motley, I have the privilege to introduce from the Department of English in the College of Liberal Arts, co-recipient of the 2012 Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship, Professor John Tobin. <laughs> Pro Professor Tobin. Your contributions to Shakespearean and Renaissance scholarship are wide ranging. You began by uncovering previously unknown influences in Shakespeare's work. Over the past 20 years, you were invited to edit multiple volumes of the Bard's plays, including the nine volumes, the nine volume Evans Shakespeare series and Evans edition of Hamlet and the forthcoming edition of King John for the prestigious British Arden editions of Shakespeare. Despite your formidable academic reputation, your colleagues praise you for being every bit as approachable, accessible, and willing to lend a hand as Hamlet's Horatio. <laughs> In recognition of your research and expertise, I am pleased today to present you with the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship. Chancellor Motley, I have the privilege to introduce from the Department of Psychology in the College of Liberal Arts, the recipient of the 2012 Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Service, Professor Joden Leem. <laughs> Professor Leem. As an administrator, graduate program director, member of the faculty, and dean, 
you have demonstrated clear vision and unflagging energy. For 12 years, you oversaw the founding and flourishing of one of our most successful and competitive academic offerings, the doctoral program in clinical psychology. You train students to serve and study socioeconomically and cultural diverse populations. Graduates, you helped to recruit and teach. Now continue your model of service by working with these underserved populations. Students praise your ability and your availability as an advisor and your mentorship of their research endeavors. In recognition, of your many years of service to our campus, to our community, I am pleased to present you with the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Service. On this day, it is my privilege to join Chancellor Motley in presenting the John F. Kennedy Award for Academic Excellence to a Most Deserving Student. Albert Chen, please step forward. Before I start out, I want to introduce your family. Stand up, family, so we can give you a round of applause. Now, while he's been away from you here with us, you already knew this, but he's a rare Renaissance man. He can learn any new skill with ease and with style grasp any difficult concept with fluency and acuity, assume leadership of any effort for any organization, and balance it all with grace and corazon. He served our undergraduate student government in multiple roles and across branches. He supplied a student perspective as a member of numerous committees. Dedicated to creating and implementing our strategic master plan our and our strategic plan, he just did it, he did it all. He founded the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship on campus and led three service trips to New Orleans. And in his free time, <laughs> he has volunteered to inspire and transform children's lives in the slums of Chimahuacan, Mexico. And so, because of his prodigious talents, our winner could have picked prestigious, high-paying opportunities, low-risk jobs anywhere in the world. But because of his compassionate heart, he has chose to devote his career to serving others. This fall, he'll enter an 11-month residency in social enterprise with New Sector Alliance, a nonprofit dedicated to social change, sponsored by AmeriCorps. After that, he hopes to use his skills, family, and his talent to help nonprofits and NGOs perform better, and eventually he's going to build his own. In recognition of his academic excellence and commitment to service, I am pleased to present the 2012 John F. Kennedy Award for Academic Excellence to Albert Shin.
Now our JFK Award winner, Albert Chen, will present remarks on behalf of the class of 2012. Thank you, Chancellor Raleigh, for the honor of being this year's JFK Award winner. Welcome, everyone, to UMass Boston, the best university in Boston. Am I right? I said it. Why is this the best university in Boston? Because we've got the best students in Boston. And now we've got the best graduating class of Boston. All right. So class of 2012, we have arrived. Here we are at the end of the road, the culmination of our UMass Boston experience. Our journeys have been full of obstacles and detours, but we have all made it here to this intersection together. The different paths that we've taken have changed us along the way. We have been shaped by our circumstances, transformed by our environment, inspired by others, and sharpened by our failures. Let me invite you into my own journey of change. Six years ago, I made the biggest decision of my life. I had just finished my first year of community college in East Los Angeles, and I was looking forward to a summer of classes. However, a life-changing opportunity came knocking on my door, and I soon found myself boarding a plane to Boston for an internship at a startup company. I left the comfort of my home, my family, my community, and everything I had known all to live in a city somewhere across the country. As the son of Taiwanese immigrants, born and raised in Montebello, California, I had no idea where Boston was, much less Massachusetts. Moving to Boston felt like jumping off a cliff. I felt alone, and I was scared. But as I fell into a new life, things began to change in me. As I adjusted to living alone, I became more independent. This new environment shaped me into a new person. I was eager to take risks and hungry for new opportunities. All these changes within me paved the way for my next journey. Three years ago, I stepped foot on this beautiful campus for the first time, and I didn't know what to expect. I had just applied to UMass Boston as a transfer student. After working in the private sector for three years, I just wanted to be a part of something more than profits and market share. I had grown a desire for social change, and it led me to this campus. But I came for more than a degree. I came for a life-changing experience. And so I transferred here, determined to make the most of every opportunity I was given to serve this campus. What I found were circumstances that transformed me every day. As a student of one of the most diverse universities in the world, I was exposed to new cultures and worldviews that opened up my mind. As a student of the only public university in Boston, I felt the growing burden of higher ed funding, affordability, and accessibility. As a student of a university without dorms, I understood the challenge of finding community on this campus. But as I was being changed, so did I seek change for the students of this campus. When I brought InterVarsity Christian Fellowship to this campus, I didn't just want to establish another student club. I wanted to form a diverse community of students, students who wanted to welcome those on the fringe, students who cared about this campus as much as their studies, students who wanted to see change in their own lives as much as in the world. I wanted students to feel comfortable calling UMass Boston their home, a home where they wouldn't have to be ashamed of their faith, their ancestry, their accents, or their school. As students, our experiences wouldn't be the same if not for the people we encounter on and off campus. Whether it's that single mom working her way through college, or that mind-blowing professor who you never thought would be a hippie, these people inspire us. But some of the most inspiring people I have met have come from the most unlikeliest of places. Two years ago, I found myself riding an overcrowded bus into the barrios of Chimalacan. I had just flown into Mexico City for a six-week opportunity to serve with a local nonprofit through InterVarsity's Global Urban Trek program. This team of internationals and locals were deeply committed to developing a sustainable and scalable model of community transformation. Wanting to learn about global urban poverty firsthand, I lived with the host family on whom my livelihood depended. Every day, 
our team walk the dirt roads filled with car trapping mud or blinding dust storms. I soon miss the drinkable tap water and flushable toilets that we all take for granted here in America. Living in these slum-like conditions opened my eyes to the vast inequalities and put a face on the marginalized people that we learn about in our classes. Above all, it was the local youth who left a lasting impression on me. These youth lived in a neighborhood run by drug cartels, crooked cops, and corrupt politicians, yet they set out to change their communities. Their name, Asehu, stands for Youth as Agents of Change. These youth brought hope to a community of hopelessness and started a movement that would affect decisions that affect them. As much as I wanted to help the people in the barrios, I realized something important. The community didn't need a foreigner like me. The community needed leaders like these youth. These brave youth defied all odds to fight for what they deserve and showed me that anyone can make a difference. I never thought that I could change the world, but the youth of Mexico have changed me. Their pursuit for change in their communities has inspired me to change my own community here on this campus and in the city of Boston. These youth have shown me that if they can change the world, so can all of us. My journey from Los Angeles to Boston to Mexico has been filled with both success and failure. Things didn't always go my way. Eight years ago, I had barely finished high school. Academically, I struggled to get passing grades. Socially, I was shy, insecure, afraid, um, afraid of taking risks, and definitely afraid of public speaking. This right here would have been a nightmare. I hadn't applied to any college because I was afraid of the future and all of its uncertainties. I felt like a failure, and I didn't know what to do. Fortunately, I had friends and family who helped me take one step at a time. And with their unwavering support, each failure made me sharper and more resilient. And every time I failed, they helped me back on my feet to take another small step. Soon, these small steps became big steps, and these big steps became leaps of faith. And these leaps landed me in Boston, then to UMass Boston, and then to Mexico. Had I not come to UMass Boston, I would have never gone to Mexico, but I did. So last summer, I found myself back on the streets of Mexico. I had returned to the same community of Chimahuacan to serve for another two months. And this time, I even brought some friends. I quickly discovered a deep sense of joy in what I did and an excitement about who I was becoming. I had found my calling to live and serve among the world's urban poor. Today, I stand before you a new and changed person, deeply transformed by my experiences here and abroad. This fall, I will begin an AmeriCorps residency with New Sector Alliance, a group dedicated to accelerating social change by strengthening organizations. I look forward to returning to Mexico for several years, equipped with new skills and experiences that will ultimately help me address urban poverty on a global scale. So class of 2012, are you ready to say goodbye to all those exams, papers, midterms, finals, and sleepless nights? I know most of us are. And those going on to grad school, well, good luck. The road ahead will be difficult. And for most of us, the road here has been difficult. Unemployment rates are probably higher than when most of us started college, which is ironic because many of us worked our way through college. Many of us have overcome painful obstacles and defied statistics to graduate. We may not always be able to change our circumstances, but as many of us have learned, we can always change the attitude with which we approach these circumstances. So as we go on from here, I have three simple challenges for us today. The first challenge is to continually put yourselves or put ourselves in the path of change. I wasn't always this certain about what I lived for, and I hadn't always cared about these issues. It wasn't until I immersed myself in the issues of the world and put myself in the path of change that I began to care about poverty and social justice. It wasn't until I came to this campus and put myself in the path of change that I began, that I found my confidence as a student and as a leader. 
It wasn't until I left my comforts in California for the uncertainties of Boston that I found my true self on the path of change. We don't all need to move across the country or travel abroad to experience change. And even if our paths lead to failure, we can still succeed in changing others and ourselves along the way. The second challenge is to seek change in the world around you. Not all of us are called to devote our lives to community service as teachers, nurses, or social workers. Some of us are called to work in finance or engineering or management. But all of us will have an influence on those we work with and the people we work for. Your very presence will shape the environment around you. Your experience will enable you to transform your circumstances. Your lives and your stories will inspire others, and your past failures will help you succeed in the future. The final challenge is for all of us to not just change the world, but to embody the values we wish to see in our world. It's not just about what we do, but who we are. Because the values we hold are the values we spread to others. Are we willing to build the character and integrity that others aspire for? Six years ago, on this very stage, then-Senator Barack Obama told the 2006 graduating class that empathy is a, char- is a quality of character that can change the world. One that makes you understand that your obligations to others extend beyond people who look like you, act like you, and live in your neighborhood. This is the kind of character that we should seek for ourselves. So class of 2012, we can change the world through the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money, and the way we empathize with others. The youth of Mexico have a motto. It reads, Se el cambio, which means be the change. This applies to all of us, whether it's bringing honesty to corporate finance or showing compassion within public policy. Be the change. Whether it's showing patience to a difficult customer or generosity to a stranger, be the change. Whether it's practicing integrity in school or humility on the basketball court, be the change. My hope is that every one of us here would embody the values that inspire others and strive to become people of character, character that can change the world. And as we move on from UMass Boston to the world, I invite all of us to ask ourselves three things. One, how have we been changed? Two, how would you like to change the world? And three, who will you be as a world changer? So class of 2012, let's go change the world. Thank you. Wow. Tremendous, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just one example of University of Massachusetts Boston students. Just one example. We will now now present our honorary degrees and Chancellor's Medal for 2012. Our university bestows honorary degrees and chancellor's medals upon individuals whose accomplishments clearly represent the values our institution hold dear. Chancellor Motley will confer the honors. Chancellor Motley, I have the honor to present to you Jackie Jenkins Cott to receive the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. So you, Jackie Jenkins Scott, are a leader, an innovator, and an agent of positive change. We welcome you to the University of Massachusetts Boston on this, our commencement day. 
When you were appointed president of Wheelock College in 2004, the late, great Senator Edward M. Kennedy praised that decision, saying, Wheelock is lucky to have Jackie leading them into the future. Those words were pre-shot. Since your appointment, Wheelock College has strengthened its academic programs, broadened its international reach, and expanded its civic engagement. With you at its helm, Wheelock has instituted pre-collegiate and college access programs, including an annual symposium for middle and high school students to help urban youths achieving and achieve in college and to prepare them for further study and fulfilling careers after they graduate. In honor of your amply demonstrated capacity for hard work, transformation, renewal, and service to your community, and Jackie Jenkins Scott, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, I confer upon you the degree of Doctors of Laws, Honoris Causa, in accordance with the usual custom and token thereof. We award you this diploma and invest you with the hood of Doctor of Laws. Congratulations. Chancellor Motley, I have the honor to present to you Carla Linton to receive the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa. Carla Linton, you are a friend, a philanthropist, a humanitarian and a dedicated volunteer. Your university, the University of Massachusetts Boston, is honored to welcome you on this commencement day. When you became a part of our community through your late husband, Ernest Linton, you helped bring together professors and administrators, students and staff to see each other as collaborators, as peers and as friends. With your grace that you still exhibit so well and your warmth, you put all at ease from new member faculty, new members of the faculty to department chairs. Since Ernest passed in 1998, you have been a dedicated supporter of the center he helped found and the University of Massachusetts Boston. Overall, you're also a longtime volunteer for hearing and vision impaired students at the Perkins School for the Blind, assisting more than 400 students over your nearly 40 years there. In recognition of your decades of service to the Perkins School and our very own institution, Carla Linton, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science, Honoris Causa, in accordance with the usual custom and in token thereof. We award you this diploma and invest you with the hood of Doctor of Science. Congratulations.
And so, Carla Linton. Carla Linton. Sorry, man. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, listen. I'm excited. It's commencement day. I'm just like the students. Ready to get going with the program. <laughs> Carla Linton, will you please remain standing to accept the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa on behalf of your late husband, Ernest A. Linton. Thank you, Provost. <laughs> Now, the University of Massachusetts, Boston is also proud to honor the memory of Ernest A. Linton, university administrator, scholar, and forger of ties between town and gown on our commencement day. As founding dean of Rutgers University's innovative Livingston College, Professor Linton was dedicated to student learning through civil and societal engagement. The University of Massachusetts benefited immensely when he brought his know-how, dedication, and his leadership to our system in 1973 as Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. He was instrumental in the creation of our College of Education and Human Development with which he co-founded an institution that, is, that has made and continues to make tremendous improvements in the functionality of regional colleges and universities in the New England area, the New England Resource Center for Higher Education. In recognition of his lifetime commitment to expanding the possibilities of higher education by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, I confer upon Ernest A. Linton the degree of Doctor of Science, Honors Clausa, in accordance with the usual custom and in token thereof. We present this diploma to Ernest's widow, Carla Linton. Thank you so much, Carla. Chancellor Motley, I have the honor to present to you Imam Mohammed Ashafa and Pastor James Bouye to receive the degrees of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Iman Mohammed Ashafa and Pastor James Bouye. You turn hate into love, vengeance into forgiveness, and violence into tolerance in your personal lives, and then you showed the way for millions of your countrymen and women to do the same. The University of Massachusetts Boston welcomes you both on this, our commencement day. Iman Ashafa, son of an Islamic scholar, you use your role of Iman to incite violence against Christians in Nigeria. Your bitterest enemy was Pastor James Bouye, whose Christian group murdered several of your family members and loved ones in religious battle, battles in Kadana. Pastor Wuye, son of a soldier, you grew up idealizing war and conflict, even after you became a pastor with the Assemblies of God. You led an attack on Imam Muhammad Ashafa's forces in Kadana and, 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 and lost your arm in that battle. You each vowed to kill each other. 
for having caused so much pain. But Iman Ashafa and Pastor Wuye, when you met by chance in 1995, you experienced a change of heart. After months of soul searching, prayers, and talk with intermediaries, you agreed to lay down your arms, forgive each other, and begin a partnership to end the violence in your beloved homeland, Nigeria. Together, you created the Interfaith Mediation Center in the Muslim Christian Dialogue Forum. Through your collaboration, schools, houses of worship, and community centers take actions to prevent violence and intervene to cut conflicts short when they do erupt. Your efforts to promote understanding have helped to contain outbreaks of violence, including the brokering of the Kaduna Compromise of 2000, a landmark peace agreement between Muslim and Christian communities in your hometown. You are now <clears throat> embarking on a five-year initiative to promote interfaith peace and tolerance across Nigeria, supported by our own Center for Peace, Democracy, and Development, and our Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance, funded by USAID, and working with our professors, Darren Q and, and Evan Weissman. In recognition of your dedication, determination, selfishness, and creativity in pursuit of peace, Iman Asafa and Pastor Wuye, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, I confer upon you both the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, in accordance with the in accordance with the usual custom and token thereof. We award you these diplomas and invest you with the hoods of Doctor of Laws. Congratulations. Chancellor Mortley, I have the honor to present to you Ambassador Anvarul K. Chaudhry for investiture with the Chancellor's Medal for Global Leadership for Peace. University of Massachusetts Boston is honored to welcome you, Honorable Chowdhury, Ambassador, former President of the United Nations Security Council, and Emissary of Peace on this our commencement day. You began your career in diplomacy in 1967 eventually serving as permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations, president of the Security Council, and of the UN Children's Fund, or UNICEF, executive board, vice president of the UN's Economic and Social Council, and coordinator for the least developed countries among many, many, many other roles. Your list of titles and responsibilities within the UN is too long to mention here, and it's very diverse, with one consistent theme. On the world stage, 
march, you give voice to the voiceless, stand up for the marginalized, and represent the disenfranchised. You are a champion for underdogs, for the cause of developing countries, for the right of women and girls to be safe and empowered, and for the rights of all children. Your initiative in the year 2000 as president of the Security Council achieved the political and conceptual breakthrough resulting in the adoption of the groundbreaking UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which for the first time affirms the need for women's participation in peace processes at all decision-making levels and recognizes that violence against women it's a global threat to peace. <laughs> and you haven't stopped. Today, you continue to point out the path to a better world through your writings, your teachings, and your speeches. In recognition of your tireless effort and leadership for global peace, justice, human rights, and sustainable development, Ambassador Honorable Chowdhury, please accept my congratulations on behalf of the University of Massachusetts Boston System for receiving the Chancellor's Medal. In accordance with the usual customs and token thereof, we award you this Chancellor's Medal for Global Peace for your leadership and for global peace. Thank you. Congratulations. And so now with our 2012 commencement address, Ambassador Chowdhury. <laughs> Greetings to all of you, Chancellor Motley, distinguished faculty members, esteemed honorary degree recipients and award recipients, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, most importantly, the graduates of 2012. I'm honored to be with you on this occasion of the 44th commencement of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, an institution which is well known for its significant contributions to the cultural and economic life of this great city of Boston and enhancing the Commonwealth's vital participation in the global community. The diversity and globality of UMass Boston is phenomenal. You should be proud that your alma mater values and provides a learning environment that nurtures respect for differences, excites curiosity, and embodies civility. It is encouraging to find that as a campus community, UMass Boston focuses on addressing critical social issues and contribute to the public good, both local and global. Its global engagement and dedication to 
rigorous, open, critical inquiry that fosters imagination, creativity, and intellectual vitality is what had certainly attracted you in the first place to this prestigious seat of learning with a long, fascinating history. And I trust those core values have by now become an integral part of you. Today is a day of significant achievement, a day of celeb celebration for UMass Boston's 2012 graduating class. You have put your energies and talents to good use. You are seeing the rewards of your hard work. You have been particularly privileged as your learning prepared you well to be independent, creative, and compassionate citizens and leaders who will shape the quality of individual and social life with a global perspective of today's interdependent world. My warmest congratulations to each one of you, my dear graduates. I would also like to congratulate the men and women who gave their best to help you attain your best, the dedicated educators and administrators of UMass Boston. Here I would play, pay a special tribute to the dedicated leadership of Chancellor Motley, President Garrett, Board of Trustees Chair Karam. And I join all of you in thanking the people whose love and sacrifice made this day possible, the enduring parents and guardians of the graduates of the class of 2012. Let us give them all a big hand. You are about to become an active and responsible part of the economic, social, and cultural forces that contribute to the progress of humanity. Your university's remarkable history and special setting, as well as its forward-looking tradition of human rights, civil liberties, and attention to the underprivileged and marginalized have prepared you well to do that with the education that you received here. So what has your hard work and an education give you. We know you have the skills and the talent to be the best at what you will do. You have made friends and colleagues that will serve you in the years to come and provide a rich network of mutual care and fondness all your lives. You have prepared yourself for success. But beyond what you have done for yourself, none of you would be here at this institution if each of you did not aspire for something bigger than yourselves. You all are here because you have an innate passion for helping humanity applying your mind and talents towards benefiting people beyond yourself. You are here bound by the spirit of this institution that you can indeed progress your lives by progressing other people's lives and that you can make yourself the happiest by making others happy. You have the passion and you have purpose, but it is not blind passion or undirected purpose. Rather, it is passion and purpose backed by hard work and attention to learning your craft. You all have delved 
into the details of your areas of study. You all have become deeply knowledgeable in your disciplines. You all have put substance behind the aspirations. And so the benefit that this institution, its mission and your hard work has brought is the warmth of emotion backed by the strength and cool precision of your knowledge-based expertise. The world awaits you all can do. Of course, you are all aware enough that the hardest problems on the planet will not have singular answers nor will they be, they be resolved with singular attempts. The hardest problems facing the world must be worked and worked diligently, repeatedly, and with patience. Each setback must be a springboard to the start of the next attempt that you embark embark upon with renewed vigor. It is your mission, your passion, backed by knowledge you have gained, that will keep moving you forward. I would like to give you an example of this from my own life, where mission, passion, and knowledge combine to help move something big for humanity. My life's experience has taught me to value peace and equality as the essential components of our existence that unleashes the forces of good and positive that is so needed for human progress. Let me share with you my own passion for the equality of participation of women at all decision-making levels everywhere. Absence of this aspect of equality, more so the absolute reticence to recognize women's positive contribution in the area of peace and security was appalling. And let me make, and that led me make to take a bold move when the opportunity arose. On the International Women's Day in 2000, I had the honor of issuing an, on behalf of the United Nations Security Council, in my capacity as its president, a statement that formally brought to global attention the unrecognized, underutilized, and undervalued contribution women have been making towards the prevention of wars, peace building, and engaging individuals and societies to live in harmony. It was recognized that peace is inextricably linked with equality between women and men. For a long time, the impression has been that women were helpless victims of war and conflicts. The role of women in fostering peace in their communities and beyond has been overlooked. In my visits to various parts of the world, I have learned that we should never forget that when women are marginalized, there is no chance for our world to get sustainable peace in the real sense. Women bring to the cause of peace distinctive experience, competence, and perspectives. Women bring a new breadth, quality, and balance of vision to a common effort of moving away from a cult of war towards a culture of peace. For generations, women have served as peace educators, both in their families and in their societies. They have proved instrumental in building bridges rather than walls. 
My mission was to ensure that the world rallied behind the cause of women's role in securing peace. And I let this goal inspire my actions through challenges and obstacles. My initiative opened a much awaited door of opportunity for women to bring a qualitative improvement in how you deal with peace and security issues. I am so inspired that this work and commitment led to the adoption of the groundbreaking UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which universally, universally recognized the women's positive contribution to peace. It is amazing that in only 12 years, just four numbers, one, three, two, five, have generated a global enthusiasm that is unprecedented. I am very encouraged that in choosing the three women laureates for the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize, the citation referred to 1325, saying that it underlined the need for women to become participants on an equal footing with men in peace processes and in peace work in general. Women's equality makes our planet safe and secure. And it is truly inspiring to find that 60% of U.S. Boston students are women. I am also immensely encouraged by all the purposeful work being done by the Consortium on Gender, Security, and Human Rights hosted by UMass Boston. On a personal note, I am proud to have the presence of the three generations of women in my life on this occasion. My wife, Mariam, my daughter, Sudeshna, and our granddaughter, Priyanka, who, like you, graduated last week. Now let me share with you the centrality of the culture of peace in our lives. From Sierra Leone to Sri Lanka, from Mongolia to Mauritius, from Paraguay to the Philippines, from Kosovo to Kazakhstan, from Bhutan to the Bahamas to Burkina Faso, I have seen time and again how people, even the humblest and weakest, have contributed to building the culture of peace in their personal lives, in their families, in their communities, and in their countries. And that ultimately is contributing to build a new and better tomorrow for humanity and to the global movement for the culture of peace that I am advocating for more than a decade and a half. Peace is integral to human existence in everything we do, in everything we say, and in every thought we have, there is a place for peace. Do not isolate peace as something separate. We should know how to relate to one another without being angry, without being violent, without being disrespectful, without neglect, without prejudice. Once we are able to do that, we are able to take the next step forward in building the culture of peace. We need to focus on empowering the individual so that each one of us becomes individually an agent of peace and nonviolence. Begin with yourself. The adoption in 1999 by the UN General Assembly of the Declaration and Program of Action on Culture of Peace was a watershed event. 
It was an honor for me to chair the nine-month-long negotiations that led to the adoption of this historic norm-setting document that is considered as one of the most significant legacies of the United Nations that would endure generations. Let us remember that the work for peace is a continuous process. Each one of us can make a difference in that process. Peace cannot be imposed from outside. It must be realized from within. Seeds of peace exist in all of us. They must be nurtured, cared for, and promoted by us all to flourish and flower. Remember that each person has their own personal cause. Whatever it is, give it an unparalleled devotion and do the best you can. I'm always inspired by the human spirit and its resilience and capacity to overcome all adversity. What impresses me most is the individual determination to improve your own condition. Before I conclude, I would ask you to look into yourselves in a world where material pursuit apparently is the be-all and end-all of human endeavor. Find a real space for spirituality in your life. In your eagerness to get something quick, never ever sell your soul. I'm confident that you will make every effort to read yourselves and your fellow men and women of the evils of intolerance and prejudice, ignorance and selfishness that compel us to repeat the cycle of violence. Your positive goals should not be achieved at the cost of others. Recognize the positive in others and value others. Recognize your own mistakes. Do not find a scapegoat for your failures. Confidence is essential, but it should not be misplaced. Do not be dogmatic to stagnate. Be flexible to move ahead so that ev so at the very end, it comes down to a question of vision and leadership. Rather than waiting for others to lead, it is incumbent on each of you to assume that you are it. So in conclusion, let your time here at this great institution serve as a call to action to you who have engaged in its ideas and its distinctive spirit, so you may wield your talents and intellect and passion towards something that moves you and moves others. And with any attempt and with every try, may you find strength in the knowledge that you tried for all of us. And just through the act of trying, you have made all our legacies richer. Congratulations to you all, class of 2012. Ambassador Salary, ladies and gentlemen. So now, 
We've come to the most important part of our ceremony, the conferral of graduate and undergraduate degrees and certificates of advanced graduate study to 3,810 students from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Yeah. We begin by presenting the candidates for doctoral degrees. Would, dean, uh, would the Dean of Graduate Studies, Dr. Zhang Go Jia, please step forward? Chancellor Motley, I have the honor to present to you the candidates present today who have satisfied the requirements for the Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Nursing Practice, or Doctor of Education, and who have been recommended for these degrees by the faculty of the College of Education and Human Development, the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, the College of Science and Mathematics, and the John McComber Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. We will confer doctoral degrees by college. Following the recognition of our doctoral candidates, University of Massachusetts Chancellor Motley will confer the degrees. Will Dr. Felisa Velinsky, Dean of the College of Education and Human Development, please come forward as the nine doctoral candidates in your college receive their degrees. Adolfo Arvela, Doctor of Education in Education, Higher Education Administration. Susan M. Baglioni, Doctor of Education in Education, Higher Education Administration. <laughs> Lloyd Sheldon Johnson, Doctor of in Education, Higher Education Administration. <laughs> Teresa Lopez, Doctor of Education in Education, Leadership in Urban Schools. Nancy Marie Ludwig, Doctor of Education in Education, Higher Education Administration. <laughs> John Coffey, McCormack, Doctor of Education in Education, Leadership in Urban Schools.
John Michael Parella, Doctor of Education in Education, Leadership in Urban School. Yonette Evelyn Sampadoma, Doctor of Education in Education, Leadership in Urban Schools. Robin A. Tuff, Doctor of Education in Education, Higher Education Administration. Will Dr. Emily McDermott, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, please come forward as the eight doctoral candidates in our college receive their degrees. Celeste Atala Guterres, Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology. Fuchs, Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology. <laughs> Valley Susan Dagmar Khan, Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology. <laughs> Sarah Ryan Lowe, Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology. Anya Ivana Potter, Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology. <laughs> Kathleen Sullivan Khalil, Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Psychology. Will Marion Winfrey, Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, please come forward as the nine doctoral candidates in your college receive their degrees. Edith Barrett, Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing. Beth Brooks, Doctor of Nursing Practice. <laughs> Judith Ann DeVoe, Doctor of Nursing Practice. Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing. <laughs> Gail B. Gal, Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing. <laughs> Julie Lynch, Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing. Yes. Jody Marcantoni, Doctor of Nursing Practice. <laughs> Patricia Miadanka Noga, Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing. Constance Bissell Schrager, Doctor of Nursing Practice. <laughs> Will 
Dr. Andrew Gosowski, Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics, please come forward as the four doctoral candidates in your college receive their degrees. Stephen A. Ravilak, Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science. Abba Sud, Doctor of Philosophy in Chemistry and Bi Biological Chemistry. Marla B. Tipping, Doctor of Philosophy in Biology, Molecular, Cellular, and Organismal Biology. <laughs> Will Dr. Connie Chan, Dean of the John W. McCormack Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, please come forward as the two doctoral candidates in your college receive their degrees. Erin E. McGuffin, or McGuffigan, Doctor of Philosophy in Public Policy. <laughs> Michael A. Tutty, Doctor of Philosophy in Public Policy. So, by the authority vested in me by President Robert Corrett and the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, okay. I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Nursing Practice, or Doctor of Education, as recommended by the faculty of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. In accordance with custom, you as individuals are entitled to all the rights and privileges which pertain to this degree here and elsewhere. Congratulations. Thank you, Chancellor Motley. Doctoral recipients, please be seated. We will now present the candidates for master's and bachelor's degrees. Their diplomas will be distributed during the college ceremonies later today. With the 1,280 candidates for master's degrees, education specialist degrees, graduate certificates, post-master's certificates, and certificates of advanced graduate study in the College of Education and Human Development, the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Management, the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, the College of Public and Community Service, the College of Science and Mathematics, the John McCormack Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies and the University College, please rise and remain standing. Rise and remain standing. and remain standing. 
Chancellor Motley, on the recommendations of the faculty and deans, I have the honor to present to you the candidates who have satisfied the requirements for the degree of Master of Arts or Master of Fine Arts or Master of Science or Master of Education or Master of Business Administration or Education Specialist Degree or for the Graduate Certificate, Postmaster Certificates or Certificates of Advanced Graduate Study. By the authority vested in me by President Robert Corrett and the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, I confer upon the certified students the degrees of Master of Arts or Master of Fine Arts or Master of Science or Master of Education or Master of Business Administration or Educational Specialist or Graduate Certificate, Postmaster Certificates or Certificates of Advanced Graduate Study as recommended by the faculty of the University of Massachusetts Boston in accordance with custom you as individuals are entitled to all the rights and privileges which pertain to this degree or certificate here and elsewhere. Chancellor Motley, will our master's, post-master certificate, graduate certificate, and certificate of advanced graduate studies recipients now please be seated. <laughs> now we will present the bachelor's degrees. As your respective colleges are announced, please rise and remain standing. Dean Emily McDermott of the College of Liberal Arts, please step forward. On the recommendation of the Dean and Faculty, will the 1,116 candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science in the College of Liberal Arts, please rise and be recognized. and Health Sciences, please step forward. Remain standing. Don't sit there. I see you. I saw him. On the recommendation of the Dean and the Faculty, will the 504 candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences please rise and be recognized. <laughs> Make a lot of noise. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Dean Quaglieri of the College of Management, please step forward. <laughs> On the recommendation of the Dean and Faculty, will the 483 candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree in the College of Management please rise and be recognized. 
Andrew Gosovsky of the College of Science and Mathematics, please step forward. <laughs> On the recommendation of the Dean and Faculty, will the 307 candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science in the College of Science and Mathematics please rise and be recognized. Anna Madison of the College of Public and Community Service, please step forward. On the recommendation of the Dean and Faculty, will the 71 candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts in the College of Public and Community Service please rise and be recognized. Felicia Wilsinski of the College of Education and Human Development, please step forward. On the recommendation of the Dean and the Faculty, will the five candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts in the College of Education and Human Development please rise and be recognized. <laughs> Chancellor Motley, I have the honor to present to you the 2,481 candidates who have satisfied the requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science in the College of Education and Human Development, the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Management, the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, the College of Public and Community Service, and the College of Science and Mathematics who have been recommended for these degrees by their faculty. By the authority vested in me by President Robert Carrett and the Board of Trustees of the University of Massachusetts, I confer upon the certified students the degree a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Science, as recommended by the faculty of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. In accordance with custom, you as individuals are entitled to all of the rights and all of the privileges which pertain to this degree or certificate here and elsewhere. Congratulations. to be seated. You're going to be about five more minutes. And then we're going to move on to our other ceremony. We got a lot to do today. We're celebrating you. So, first of all, now, congratulations. But there's a custom at every university commencement, we induct all of our graduates into our family of alumni of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. We do this because the strength of our university depends upon each and every one of you. 
As I mentioned earlier, there are nearly 90,000 alumni of the University of Massachusetts Boston, State College of Boston, State Teachers College at Boston, Boston State College, and Boston Normal School. Alumni of all of these proud institutions give witness to the great value of public higher education. With Adrian Hagerbrook, from the class of 2002 and president of our Alumni Association come forward and our John F. Kennedy Award winner, Albert Chen, representing the student body, come forward for the Alumni Association induction. for the mic. All right, here we go. Will all the members of the class of 2012 please stand? Everybody. Everyone. <laughs> Chancellor Motley and Alumni Association President Hogabrook inscribed upon this scroll are the names of every class of 2012 undergraduate and graduate student. I request that each name be permanently added to the list of distinguished and revered alumni of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. We ask that the University of Massachusetts, Boston Alumni Association help direct our services to the university so that our class joins all alumni in helping to bring honor to our university. Thank you. Members of the graduating class of 2012, we welcome you. All University of Massachusetts Boston alumni join you in your pledge to bring honor to Boston's great public university. We welcome you to the association and we will follow you and be with you with all the success that you bring. Thank you. Before we dismiss each college to conduct its own separate ceremony, our University of Massachusetts Boston Chamber Singers will lead us in singing the UMass Boston Alma Mater, a song that celebrates the tradition and values of our university. Please refer to the inside back cover of your programs for the lyrics and the history of the song. I'm going to actually stand over here so we can hear the name.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we conclude the main ceremony of our 44th commencement. The provost is going to give you recession directions in a moment. Graduates, as you go forth, take pride in the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and make us proud of you. Congratulations, 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 class of 2012. Each college will be led by its dean and faculty to the separate college ceremonies. We ask that families and friends please remain in your places until all the graduates have recessed. Marshal Tobin and flag bearers, please take your places. Trustees and honored guests, 